of fairness and excellent duration. And some directions in the space uh, of fairness that I think are uh, interesting. Uh, can everyone make my slides fine right here? Does everything work? Okay, thank you. All right, and so like the first thing that I want to start with is a disclaimer that you know unfairness is not just an algorithmic problem, it's actually a societal problem. And it's a problem that's going to you know, show up at like several levels of our society. Uh, and you know, just to give a few examples, for example, in the US, we know that there is uh, a disparate access to education as a function of race and socioeconomic status. We know that there is you know, some disparate access to financial resources and loans. We know there can be inequalities in policing and criminal justice that also depend on like race. Um, here, for example, on this slide, I have an example in which you can see that like uh, marijuana consumption uh, across uh, like white and black people has been like very similar from like 2000 to 20, 2010, but arrests for race have been like very disparate across white and black people. And so, here, this is obviously like a very like non exhaustive list, but I just wanted to point out that this is not just you know an algorithmic problem, this is really a societal problem. <clears throat> but today, what I'm going to do, what I want to start with, is to start with the algorithmic aspects of fairness. Uh, and the reason I want to do this is first because you know I'm by training a computer scientist, this is really what I'm most qualified to talk about. But also, I just want to point out that like machine learning algorithms and algorithms are used at least partially to automate like really important life altering decisions that are made about individuals today. And so if the algorithms are going to be using are unfair, well, this is going to be a big problem. And in all of the examples that I just mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we'll see, you know, algorithms are actually playing some role today. So it's important to think about uh, whether those algorithms are going to be fair. And so here I'm just going to start with machine learning algorithms in like really the most general sense of, of the term. So like, you know, something that has any kind of like systematic rules that are going to map some input to an output. Uh, for example, like I could say that an exam can be seen as an algorithm. You're going to give students some questions and you're going to map, you know, the inputs, like the answers that the students are going to give to uh, a score in some systematic way. Like did they get the answer right or not? Or you have, you know, a graded grid. Uh, and the reason I started with this as an example is because I wanted to go through the example of uh, college admissions once again, where we know that there are persistent disparities in enrollment across race and socioeconomic statuses. Um, and here we know that to some extent, uh, and historically, admissions have partially relied on test scores such as, you know, the SAT or the uh, GRE. And here we can kind of like see, you know, the SAT and the GRE affect like some algorithms that are going to take students and, you know, their answers as an input and try to map them to a score. That score is going to, you know, be supposed to give some insight on their, uh, you know, qualification level, like the level of preparation for college. Like another case in which we know, we believe that there are really significant disparities is, you know, in policing and in justice system in general. And like there, once again, we know that algorithms are going to play a role. Uh, for example, if you look at policing nowadays, it's sometimes been assisted by uh, predictive policing algorithms uh, that, you know, are going to tell you where crime is likely to occur and like where you should allocate, uh, you know, police resources. Uh, but also algorithms are going to be used in the justice system. And we know today, like Compass uh, is an algorithm that has been used uh, to, uh, you know, assign risk uh, scores to defendants. And it's supposed to like you know evaluate the risk that someone's going to uh, risk debate, and it's being used uh, to inform uh, bell decisions. Another example, I'll just go through a last one. But if you look at like loan decisions today, um, once again, algorithms are going to be playing a role in those decisions. Um, like an obvious one is what happens if you look at uh, you know credit scores. So we know that today loan decisions depend partially on credit scores and the credit score themselves are, you know, an algorithm that are going to grade someone's credit worthiness. And on top of that, like banks also have their own machine learning algorithms that are going to look at potential lenses attributes and also credit scores and are trying to uh, come up with decisions on like who to give a loan to based on this. <sighs> And so right now, you know, because like algorithms play such an important role in society and can be a major source of unfairness, like what I want to do first uh, in this tutorial is to focus on fairness and unfairness at the uh, level of a single machine learning algorithm. 
And to do that, I'm going to start with a very restrictive assumption. And uh, later during this talk, I'll try to move away from this assumption. But right now, I really want to focus on like, what's going on at the level of single algorithm. And so I'm going to make the assumption that right now, our goal is really not to correct like past disparities or like past discrimination. Uh, and rather, what I want to do right now is I have an algorithm, and I want this algorithm to make decisions that are fair today based on populations and agents attributes today and right now. And so like an example of what I'm saying here, and like once again, I insist that this is restrictive for now, but the example is that imagine like you have two students and like one student like had faced like significant like disparities did not have the same educational opportunities as the other students. And so like student one today is maybe not as qualified as student two. So it's not unfair in college to decide to admit student two over student one based on their current level of readiness and chance of success in college right now. And so even at the level of like a single algorithms, even like under these restrictive assumptions, there can be issues of fairness. Uh, but a lot of people are going to tell you, well, but you know, that can't be true because what we're doing right now is like we're looking at an algorithm that's, you know, making decisions using like mathematic rules, like using systematic rules. It can't be wrong. It can't be partial. This is a computer doing this. It's just math. Um, and one of the reasons this is going to be a bad critic is if you think about it, well, who's going to set the rules that the algorithm is going to be using? And it's going to be humans in some way. It's either be either going to be that a human, you know, has designed the rules of the algorithm, or it can be that like a human is going to intervene in some way because the data that we're using to train the algorithm to learn the rules is actually generated by human beings. And so you should expect that human bias is going to come in those algorithms. <clears throat> and, you know, just to give an example of like something that has actually happened in real life that has been argued in real life, is that some of those algorithms you know, are actually unfair in real life. So if I go back to COMPASS, which is an algorithm that's basically estimating the risk of uh, recidiv recidivism, sorry, uh, that the finance have, and that's using like those decisions to, uh, I mean, sorry, those scores to uh, inform bell decisions. Well, uh, there was a study by ProPublica in 2016 that looked at the COMPASS algorithm and that basically said, well, if you look at what the COMPASS algorithm is doing, they're really overestimating the risk of recidivism for black defendants and they're underestimating the risk for white defendants. Um, and just like a quick example of this is, you know, if you just look at this picture intuitively, uh, this guy right here, um, you know, has a history of armed robberies of grand theft and he was assigned a low risk of three versus this person who only has juvenile misdemeanors, like, you know, stealing a kid's bag and a scooter has a much higher risk of eight. So intuitively, if you just look at this picture, there seems to be something kind of wrong here. But just more generally, what they're kind of like showing uh, at a higher level, what they're showing statistically, is that there is, so they perform a statistical analysis and they show that like, there is a huge difference in the false positive and false negative rates across both populations. So they're saying, you know, what's the probability that someone who's not going to recidivate is going to uh, you know, uh, not be given, uh, not be given a bail, and they found that this probability is like much, much higher here, like almost forty-five percent in the black population rather than in the white population. So basically, like black defendants, like were much more likely to be predicted to be high risk when they were not going to risk debate. When white, like white defendants, were much more likely to be claimed low risk and risk debate. So it seems like there is a fairness issue right here. Uh, coming out of this algorithm. So I hope that this convinced you that it's not just because you know you're using an algorithm that decisions are going to be you know fair, but then even if unfairness can come uh, as the result of an algorithm, well, another critic would just be that yeah, okay, sure, you know my algorithm can be wrong, it can be unfair, but it should be really easy to fix this because I, the only thing that I have to do is I need just to not take any sensitive attribute like race or gender or social economic status into account. If I'm race blind, I can't discriminate. Um, and there are a couple issues with this, but one of the reasons this is not going to work is first that algorithms are never truly going to be race blind or unaware. Um, you know, even if you take sensitive attributes out of your inputs, there's 
often going to be other attributes that correlate with the sensitive attribute that can give you information about the value of that sensitive attribute. An example of this uh, would be, you know, right by name. So I think like a lot of you guys know that like mortgage like loan companies used to have maps of you know where it was safe and not safe to leave to give loans to people. It was kind of like based on location and zip codes. And you know uh, what happened is if you look at areas that are marked red and like marked like high risk, well those areas also like well uh, correlated with like having strong concentrations of uh, minorities. And when red lightning was pretty much still legal. What you could do is, even if you don't take race as a sensitive attribute um, into your machine learning algorithm, you can just like take location as an attribute instead and say, well, you know, based on location, if you're coming from one of those areas in red, I'm not going to give you a loan. And that would be like a very obvious proxy you know, for race here. And so you could discriminate based on a sensitive attribute just looking at like someone's location. <clears throat> Another issue is that there is a difference between disparate treatment and disparate impact. And so like disparate treatment kind of like means that you're going to be using like a one size fit all rule that you're going to use like the same rule for everyone. So for example, the rule is not going to use the sense of attribute into account, race into account, everyone's going to be treated the same way. But disparate impact means that you're going to have possibly a disproportionate impact on possibly different groups. And generally, what's going to happen is that if you're going to require that there is no disparate treatment, you're probably going to face some disparate impact. So like those two notions are generally going to be incompatible. And to give an example of this, um, so there is a great paper called On the Impossibility of Fairness by uh, Friedler, Scheidegger, and Pankata Subramanian that's uh, actually looking at this issue. And like what they're arguing is the following. We're arguing, so imagine I want to make, uh, you know, I want to make decisions about individuals. And so, you know, they have like some true features X that belong to a construct space right here. And then, you know, there is some true mapping F, but mapping may be very complicated, might be a very complex randomized function, but you know, there is a true mapping F from like those features X to a decision or a prediction. And so, you know, really you could imagine like there is an ideal decision or prediction, which is going to be, you know, that function of X. Uh, and if, Things are like this. Well, you know, everything is kind of like fine. You just have to use that ideal like true mapping if you happen to know it, uh, and your decision to be fair. But the problem is that really in real life, what happens is like you never really get to see this construct space. What you see is like an observed space in which you see some observed features go here, and those observed features are going to be you know some possibly randomized complex mapping of the true features X. And you're possibly going to like lose a lot of information here when you look at the observed features compared to the compared to you know the true uh, features. And then you're going to make your decisions using like a proxy mapping that you're going to apply to the observed features. But importantly, what you're doing in the end is like you're not using the true decision rule. You're using something that is a composition of you know this process of going through to the observed features and then like a proxy mapping that's going to be possibly very different from like, the ideal rule that you would like to use. And the problem here, what in those fairness issues, is that you can imagine like different populations, individuals are going to have very different mappings from true features to observed features. In which case, if you treat everyone the same way, you're going to have a problem. Um, and a possible example of this would be to you know look at a GRE or SAT scores, and you can imagine like an SAT score is going to be an observed feature, which is going to be a proxy to measure, uh, you know, maybe a true feature, which is like a student's qualification level, like how ready the student is going to be for college. But that SAT score might have very different meanings, for example, for different social economic statuses. Um, you know, because your social economic status is going to affect how prepared you are specifically for this test. Like if you can take prep courses to get specifically ready for the SAT, that's definitely going to give you an edge over everyone else. Uh, if you're of a higher social economic status, and you fail the SAT the first time, or you don't have the score that you want, you can just like keep taking it over and over again until you get the score that you want, and then just you know report your best score. Versus if you're like if you don't have uh, access to like being able to take the SAT several times, well you get one shot and that's it. So here you could imagine that if you look at like two different populations, like two different social economic statuses, and you treat them. You, give, you, you apply the same rule to them based on like their SAT score, there could be disparities that arise from this because the SAT score is going to mean different things for those two different populations. <clears throat> uh, 
And just before um, I start thinking about, and I started telling you about how we can, uh, you know, um, fix um, some of these issues and like what kind of definition of fairness we want to look at. I just wanted to give you like some of the reasons there uh, can be like such unfairness in algorithms. And you know, like one obvious reason is going to be that there is a lot of like data bias. Um, so for example, if I just look at this example right now, this uh, infographic is actually kind of like looking at uh, the rate at which uh, applicants of color have been denied loans. And what they're doing is like, they're looking at like a hundred similarly qualified applicants. So like those applicants are like technically supposed to be similarly qualified. And they're saying that if you're a white applicant versus if you're a black applicant at the same qualification level, you're much more likely to be denied if you're a black applicant, for example. Um, and one of the things that can be going on here is that historically for racist reasons, you know that we know that like minorities and people of color were denied loans. And if you're going to be using historical data, like racist historical data to train your decision-making algorithms, then your algorithm is going to mimic past bias. It's going to learn that, you know, in the past, we did not give loans to minorities. So no, we should actually not give loans to minorities or we should give loans to minorities at, uh, you know, uh, a smaller rate. There can also be issues in which you have like data imbalance so for example, if you're going to have like much more data about the majority group than a minority group, um, you know, just by definition of the minority group being a minority group being a lot much smaller, well, your algorithm might just overfit to the majority group if you're not uh, careful. And that, you know, can be a problem if like the same attributes across different groups are going to have different meanings across uh, different populations. Um, like one story that happened a couple of years ago was that uh, Amazon tried to build a machine learning algorithm to help with recruiting. But like what happened is like the algorithm actually showed bias against uh, women. Um, and the reason was that basically the uh, AI was trained on very imbalanced data in which they basically like the uh, machine learning algorithm mostly saw CVs that were coming from male employees and they had like very little information about male employees. And so the machine learning algorithm just learned, well, I'm going to keep, you know, hiring people like the ones that I've seen so far and that must be male employees. So I'm going to, you know, learn that like, male employees are the employees that I should be hiring and I'm going to discriminate against female employees. I'm a female candidates. But like another example in which that arises is if you look at genetic data, uh, if you look at genetic data today, uh, you know, 90% of the genetic data that we get uh, is coming from European sources. Um, and this genetic data is used a lot nowadays to, you know, try to predict the prevalence of like some disease, right, to find the right treatments. And what's happening is that if you're using this kind of data to, uh, you know, like make important medical decisions, well, you're kind of like overfitting these medical decisions to the European population without really thinking about how they're going to affect other populations. Like you can't really expect that like anything trained on this data is going to lead to viable predictions and like apply to other populations. Another thing, and that's kind of like what I talked about when I was talking about the SAT example, but generally you're only going to have to access to proxies rather, you know, true uh, interesting attributes about someone. Uh, another possible reason is like you might just have poorly spe specified your learning objective and metric, or you might uh, unconsciously have like put some of your bias in your, you know, your, your learning objective in which your algorithm might do, might do something that's unfair. And you know, there are many, many other uh, reasons that uh, unfairness could happen. I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, go through a few of them. But right now I want to talk about more about, you know, how do we think about those issues? Like what kind of definitions, what kind of metrics do we look at for fairness? And like what kind of interventions can we do to make algorithms more fair? And one of the first uh, definitions of fairness that I want to go through is individual or metric fairness. And I want to go through this definition of fairness because it has like a very kind of like intuitive uh, natural uh, interpretation. Uh, so that fairness was like, uh, that definition of fairness was studied in this paper, Fairness Food Awareness by uh, Twerk, Hart, PTC, Rangold, and Semmel. And just the idea is like, if you have two individuals that are very similar to each other, that look kind of like the same, well, you should probably just treat them the same way, otherwise it's going to be very unfair, right? And the idea is very simple. You basically look at the mechanism M and you're going to say that this mechanism is fair uh, if and only if 
basically, so you're going to look at the closeness. So there's going to be some measure D of closeness between the output of mechanism, the mechanism on, you know, features X and features Y. So you can think of X and Y as like two different people and like with like two different sets of features. And we're going to say that, you know, um, if the distance here in green between the features of X and Y, so distance between X and Y is small, well, the distance between the outcomes m of x and m of y. So the distance between the, the scores that I'm going to be assigning to uh, those two different individuals, or uh, you know, the decisions that I'm going to make on those two different uh, individuals, or the distribution of decisions that I'm going to make on those two different uh, individuals, well, they're going to have to be close to each other because they're going to have to be smaller than you know the measure of closeness between their features. So it really just says here if x and y are close to each other then the outcomes of mechanism M on X and Y are going to have to be close to each other. That's so a very natural definition of fairness, but there are some difficulties if you actually try to use the definition of fairness in practice, because first you have to decide, like what are those metrics that you're going to use? Uh, how do you decide what the Z is? How are you going to decide whether individuals are going to be similar? But also you have to decide what are going to be the features. Like, do I want to compare people together based on their observed features? Do I want to compare people together based on their true features that I don't really have access to? And then if you know, if I start saying, well, I want to say that individuals are similar in true features to be treated the same way, that leads to some statistical difficulties, right? Because, um, so I want to treat people the same way depending on like whether they have you know, the same qualification level for a job, but, once again, I really only have access to imperfect proxies here. I have access to uh, incomplete information. And just using the imperfect proxies, this incomplete information may lead to unfair decisions at the individual level, because I just don't have enough information to really know the true qualification level of each and every single individual in my population. But what may be a bit easier is to look instead at group level definition of fairness. Maybe it's hard for me to like learn exactly the qualification level of like each individual, but it's a bit easier to learn statistical properties of a population, you know, at the level of like a much larger group. And this motivates the study of notions of fairness, uh, such as statistical fairness, in which basically what you want to do is you want to guarantee that some statistical relationship is going to hold uh, similarly across different groups or uh, different sensitive genes. Now, if you take such a definition of statistical fairness, it might be a bit unfair if you zoom in on, uh, you know, to the individual level. But if you look at what's going on in average across groups, we're going to make decisions that are roughly going to be fair. It's just going to be here easier to have like those statistical group level relationships from past data than just looking like individual level attributes. And it's also like going to require fewer assumptions. So to explain those uh, definitions of uh, statistical fairness, I just wanted to go through a few notations first. Uh, and so the first notation we're going to have here is A. So A is going to uh, be used to uh, talk about the sensitive attribute that someone has. So you can imagine A, you know, being your race or your gender or your socioeconomic status. And then we'll say that people have features that have true features X and there is an outcome Y, which is some possibly complex, possibly randomized function of X. But this outcome Y is going to be, you know, for example, whether someone is uh, whether someone's going to risk debates, whether someone's going to commit a crime again. And then we're going to have a scoring or a decision rule R, which is going to be some, you know, classifier, some machine learning algorithms that's going to take as inputs the uh, features uh, uh, features of the agents and their uh, sensitive attributes. And the first like most basic definition of fairness we can think of is independence, which means that basically your machine learning algorithm, like the score that you're going to assign to people is going, in the, is going to be independent of their uh, sensitive attributes. It's going to be statistically independent of the sensitive attributes. And that's basically what you can call like demographic parity. That's demographic parity in real life. Because you're basically saying that like the matter, I have two groups A and B, and I look at any possible you know, score that my machine learning algorithm is going to uh, assign that distribution of score is going to be the same in group A and in group B. 
So here I'm just you know, looking at like the probability of the score being R conditional on the group for the sensitive attribute deep A. So here I'm just telling you that probability in group A is going to be the same as the probability in group B. So for example, it just says I'm going to hire the same fraction of people from population A and from population B. Um, just a quick note here is that you can obviously look here I'm using inequality, but you can obviously have like approximate versions of like all of those statistical definitions of fairness. But now what I want to point out is that if you think about demographic parity, one thing that can actually go wrong is the following. Uh, the following is, remember that I told you so that A, sensitive attribute, R is the score, but also there is Y, which is, you know, the true score, like true outcome of a person. And we haven't actually taken this true score Y into account at all in our fairness metric. And so that means that the following thing can actually go wrong. Uh, one way to satisfy demographic parity is to just hire, for example, if I'm in you know, a hiring setting, I can hire the same fraction of people into groups A and B. But in group A, I'm going to hire the top people, I'm going to hire the most qualified people. In group B, I'm going to hire people at random, I'm going to hire the least qualified people, or you know, I'm going to do something else that's a bit crazy. But now I am technically satisfying demographic parity because I hire the same fraction of people in population A and population B. But I can do something very malicious here because I can tell you, well, you know, I hire the best people in population A and I hire the worst people in population B. And I was being fair, you know, according to our definition of demographic parity. But now I'm just going to tell you that uh, we should not hire people in group D in the future because based on like the data we collected so far, based on people that we hired, people in group B are really not qualified. So that can be really bad. You can have like really malicious outcomes if you don't think carefully about what you're doing with demographic parity. So I just want to point this um, out. Another definition of fairness now that actually tries to you know, build up on this and takes the actual true label, true outcome Y into account is going to be separation. And separation is going to mean that if you condition on the true label of someone, then the score and the uh, the score that you assign and the sensitive attribute are going to be statistically indefinite. If you want to write this, you know, in a probabilistic relationship, like right here, uh, this is going to look like this, saying that if you condition on uh, someone actually having a true label or outcome of Y and a sensitive attribute of uh, A, well, uh, the probability they have going to be uh, the probability they're going to have like a given score of R condition on this Y here is going to be the same whether I'm in group A or whether I'm in group B. So now I'm basically saying people that have the same true label, people that have the same actual unit outcome, they're going to get the same score, no matter what group they're going to be in. So it sounds, you know, fair in the sense that, you know, you're actually um, taking you know, someone's, for example, qualification level, whether they're going to be successful in college into account. And you're saying that people that have the same qualification level are going to get the same score, no matter what group they're going to be in. And you can kind of like rewrite this definition. Uh, and if I look specifically at the case in which, uh, you know, Y and R are going to be binary. So I'm going to look at like binary classifiers and I'm going to look at binary outcomes. Like I commit a crime or I don't commit a crime. I am qualified for college or I'm not qualified for college. You can rewrite this like those two definitions, which basically just translates into across group A and group B, like you know any pair of groups A and B, you will have equality of true negative rates and true positive rates. So equality of you know predicting that someone who's uh, negative is actually like negative, and like equality in the rate at which you are going to predict that someone who's actual whose uh, true label is positive is actually going to be positive. One of the problems with this, with like separation and like equality of like uh, true positive, true negative rates, is that they can really be heavily affected by the population distribution. Um, and so one thing that can happen here is the following. So here I'm going to look at like two different populations that are uh, red and blue. And for each of them, there's going to be a given probability that they're going to commit a crime. For example, for example if I release them. So here, you know, like this 0 0.7 means that like the true probability that this person is going to commit a crime, if I release them, is going to be 0 0.7. Um, and here, you know, I'm actually going to assume that I magically 
know exactly each person's probability of recidivism. And now I'm going to say, well, you know, if someone has a risk of more than like 0 0.5, a probability of like more than 0 0.5 of actually committing a crime, I'm not going to release them. I am not going to keep them a bail. Um, and so here, all those people here in the red population, all those people here in the blue population are going to be classified to be pretty risky. Um, and in principle, this is kind of like arguably a fair thing to do because in both populations, we're actually using the same risk level to decide whether someone is going to be risky or not. But if you look at what's going to happen in terms of like false positive rates and false uh, negative rates, well, you can see here that like the false positive rates here and false positive rates here are going to have huge disparities. And this is coming from the fact, basically, I mean, you can do the calculation for yourself, but this is coming from the fact that those two populations have like very kind of like different distributions of risk. So you're treating them the same way, but that results in like very different false positive rates. So false positive rates and false negative rates are like not always super informative. And that was actually the defense that uh, North Point, so the people that came up with the uh, compass algorithm uh, came up with, because when ProPublica told them, well, you know, like black defendants have much higher false positive rates. So there is obvious unfairness. What North Point said is, well, that's a result of, you know, different population distributions and you know our scores are like very well calibrated. They're going to assign very meaningful risk and travel to levels. And we've been using the same threshold on risk for everyone on you know, well calibrated probabilities, and well calibrated risk. So we are fair. So there is no problem here. Which leads me to a third notion of statistical fairness, which is efficiency and which is going to actually be related to calibration. And that definition of fairness requires that if you um, actually condition now on the score that you're assigning to someone, well, the sensitive attribute and their true label, true outcome, are going to be independent of each other. And this is actually related, and it's actually equivalent to calibration by groups. So if I'm, uh, when I'm looking at like a binary uh, outcome, so I'm saying like the true outcome is like once again, zero or one. So whether you're going to commit a crime or not commit crime, what that definition says is basically, so it's equivalent here to the fact that your probability is going to be well calibrated. What that means is that if I'm going to assign a score of R, to a group of people. And I look at the probability that someone has a true label of one. So for example, it's going to be a fun among all of the people to which I gave a score of R. Well, the probability that's going to happen is going to be equal to R. So an expectation, an, uh, an R fraction of these people are going to, for example, commit a crime. So here it kind of like, you know, says that like R represents the actual expected risk of the agents that are in this population to which I assign a score of R. But there are once again, things that can go wrong with calibration. And here is one thing. So here, once again, I'm going to assume that, you know, those are kind of like the true risks, like true probabilities that some people are going to uh, uh, re-offend. And one thing I can do is, if I look at the average of all of those numbers here, it's actually going to be 0 0.4. And what I can do is I can assign the risk of 0 0.4 to everyone in this first group in red. What's going on here is that this is actually well calibrated in group one, because if I look at the set of all agents to which I assign a score of 0 0.4, well, that's the whole population. And among all of those, agents, the average risk, the probability they're going to recidivate is roughly, I mean, it's going to be 0 0.4, because it's the average of those numbers. In group two, I'm just going to give people exactly their true risk. And now I'm going to say, well, I'm going to classify as before people as risky, and I'm not going to realize them if their score is going to be higher than 0 0.5. But what is happening now is that, well, in the first population, I had a few people that had a score higher than 0 0.5, but because I grouped them all together with low risk people, I just now have a score that's well calibrated, but in which everyone is going to be under the threshold. So I'm not arresting anyone in population one, but I'm arresting people in population two. And so intuitively, that seems like very wrong and very unfair. So like, once again, there is a problem here. So uh, how much time do I have left? Just like 
15 minutes according to the agenda. Okay. All right, sounds good. Uh, cool. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so before I keep going, I just want to give a quick word on interventions. I'm not going to spend too much time on this uh, because there is a huge, huge amount of work on interventions for fairness. I'll just give you a few examples. But just overall, if you want to get any of the statistical definitions of fairness, there are three main approaches that you can take. One of them is pre-processing, which is going to require that you have access to the data you're going to work on data itself. And like an example of what you can do in pre-processing is you don't look really at the machine learning algorithm itself, but you modify your features X, your initial features that you're going to be using to be kind of like independent of the sensitive attributes. Uh, if you do this, you get demographic parity for free because now your features contain no information about the sensitive attributes. Uh, and that was done, for example, in the learning fair representation paper by uh, Zemel, who's rescued it at CN Torek. You can also, and there is a lot of work doing this, but there is a lot of work in which you can basically just uh, modify your algorithm at training time, which requires that you have access to the algorithm. What I mean here is that you can, you know, add explicit fairness constraints, or you can regularize the laws in your algorithm in your predictive model to take fairness into account. And you can also do some post-processing in which you only require to have black box access to the algorithm. Uh, one thing you can do is you can look at a model, a black box model, and you can take some of the predictions of this model and like flip them some probability to kind of like manipulate the probability of you know giving a, a positive score to someone or like to manipulate the false positive and false negative rates. This is what's done, for example, in the equality of opportunity in supervised learning work by Hart, Price, and Cerebro. But there is like a lot of work. There's many, many more relevant papers, and I just don't have time to cover all of them today because I only have you know, 15 minutes left. Um, but also one thing that I wanted to uh, point out about this definition of fairness and statistical definition of fairness is that under very mild assumptions, they're going to be incompatible with each other. And so you can't just like have the best of all words. You're gonna have to pick one of them. Uh, under mild assumptions, you can't have any two of them at the same time. So you can't have independence and separation. At the same time, you can't have independence and sufficiency at the same time, and you can have separation and sufficiency at the same time. So one big question is like, yeah, what are you going to do now? And I think uh, a lot of the answer to this is this is also going to you know depend uh, on the bigger context. This is going to depend on like you know domain specific knowledge. But I'll get into this a bit more uh, later on. Another critic of this group definition of fairness is that they might actually not really be fine green enough. Because if I'm telling you, oh, well, I'm going to have an algorithm that's going to be fair among white and black people, it's going to hire the same uh, number of white and black people, and I'm going to have an algorithm that algorithm is going to hire the same fraction of like uh, male and female from the population. Well, this algorithm, no, you know, it satisfies our definition of group fairness here at the level of like the white and black population. It satisfies the definition of group fairness at the level of our male and female populations. But if you look at subgroups, all bets are off. And like one thing you can do is you can only hire white males and black females, and you can call it fair according to your definition of group fairness. But it doesn't, it is obviously not fair if you start looking at subgroups that are constituted of several. Um, of several uh, uh, sensitive attributes. So basically, those notions of group fairness are going to guarantee nothing at the level of the subgroup. And this is you know, related to the problem that we saw for calibration before, like how you're going to group people together is going to matter a lot. What's happening here is that you group everyone together and your prediction are well calibrated at the level of the whole group, but they're really not well calibrated at the level of like any you know, interesting subgroup of this population. And there is like some cool work that I just wanted to point you guys to that's addressing some of those issues. But for demographic parity and equality of true positive and true negative rates, uh, there is the Preventing Fairness Gerrymandering paper by Kearns, Neil, Roth, and Wu. And for calibration, there is the multi calibration paper by Herbert Johnson, Kim, Reingold, and Roth Blum. Um, and the idea of those papers is that instead of like guaranteeing fairness for you know, a population that's going to be partitioned into a few groups, you, they show how you can guarantee fairness for large, structured, and like possibly overlapping subgroups of individuals. I also want to point out that there are causal notions of fairness. In the interest of time, I'm not really going to go through them. 
but I just wanted to give you like a bit of motivation of why you might want to think about such causal notions of fairness. Um, and so motivation for this is that different causes of unfairness can actually be really indistinguishable from each other when you're just looking at the statistical and distributional data, because you can have like a lot of confounding effects. It's hard to tell which variables are going to be causal and correlated and which ones are actually you know, causing the effect that you're seeing and the unfairness that you're seeing. And so to kind of like understand those issues, you're going to need to actually work with the right explanation with the right causal graph. And there are some relevant papers. There are actually many more, but I just wanted to you know, cite the two that actually I think and ideally started this area of work in the space of fairness. There is the avoiding discrimination through causal reasoning by Kilbertus, uh, Rojas Garuya, Parascandolo, Hart, Jensing, and Fokov, and counterfactual fairness by Kostner, Loftus, Russell, and Salva. Um, and I don't really have time to say much more about those papers, but if you get a chance, I think you know, those are really good papers to check out. No, the last thing that I want to do in this talk is to try to uh, put algorithmic fairness, you know, into a bit more context, because all I talked about so far was fairness at the level of a single algorithm. How do we make an algorithm more fair? What are different definitions of fairness? What are different interventions for fairness? But to me, and I think like one of the most exciting, like one of the most important research direction in the space of fairness is to really go beyond a single algorithm to put algorithmic fairness kind of like back into its broader context. And I think there are several ways you can do this, but you know, like one of the reasons I want to think about those issues is because if you want to make algorithms fairer, well, you know, it's going to be a crucial building block towards a fairer society because we're using algorithms everywhere nowadays to make important decisions about people. But if you're developing fair algorithms without really looking at the broader context and how they're going to affect society, you can actually, that could lead to very unintended consequences. So you really have to think about like, how your algorithms are going to fit into this broader context. One first thing that I want to mention, and I think is of interest to a lot of people in the CS account community, is uh, the fact that there is often a lot of strategic behavior that happens when you're using machine learning algorithms. So you can't really, you really can't most of the time think that machine learning algorithms are going to be static, that the inputs are going to be static. It's going to be especially true when you're going to be looking at you know, high stake life altering decisions that those algorithms are going to be making. Because we're going to expect you know, people to try to game the algorithm, to modify their features in some way, to try to improve their outcomes. When you know, like an example of this is if you're planning to you know, apply for a loan and your credit score is going to be kind of low, well, you're probably going to start taking action to try to improve your credit score. Uh, one thing you could do is you could start opening like new credit card that you're never going to use. But what you're doing is you're trying to adapt your features to the credit scoring algorithm so that you're going to get better ones in the future. And there is a lot of work on strategic machine learning. So here I'm just going to mention like a few things that don't really take fairness into account, but there's a lot of interesting directions in which you can try to, you know, be robust to gaming. You can try to Insensitize people to modify useful and meaningful features instead of like just trying to game the algorithm. There is a lot of work that's trying to relate this strategic behavior to causality. Uh, but here, once again, there is a huge amount of work on this. Um, not going to be able to cite all of this, but I feel free to kind of like, you know, look for strategic uh, manipulation, strategic machine learning, strategic classification, uh, and like those keywords, and you should be able to find a lot of work in this lines. But I also want to point out that this uh, work can be very interesting in the space of fairness. And there has been some work that has looked at the intersection of strategic machine learning and fairness. Some of this work has looked at how different populations may have disparities in their abilities to modify features and how this is going to affect their outcomes. Uh, one of those papers is the social cost of strategic classification by Millie, Miller, Dragon, and Hart. The other one is the disparate effects of strategic manipulation by who? Well, uh, Nicole Imorlika, who's right here today, and Bogan. But also, like, there has been some recent work that has tried to uh, look at disparities in information about the model and how this is going to affect how different agents are going to strategize in different populations. Uh, and one of those papers is strategic classification in the dark by Galme, Nair, Eilat, Telgan Cohen, and Rosenfeld. 
And here I'm also going to shamelessly talk about some of my uh, own work, but we have a paper on this that's called Information Discrepancy in Strategic Learning by uh, Behava, Putnata, Wu, and myself. Another direction that I think is important is that generally when you're going to think about fairness, you know, you're not going to be making a single decision about an individual. Often you're going to have many decisions that are going to compose with each other over time, over life. And you know, you can have decision pipelines like this in which maybe inequality of access to opportunities in which unfairness is going to possibly arise at several stages of such decision pipelines. And those disparities can really compose. Um, And the fairness and our composition work by Dwork and Inovento actually showed that those are pretty complicated things to analyze. Because if you have a pipeline of such decisions, you can show that like, even if each algorithm in the pipeline is going to be fair, the composition of all those algorithms, the whole pipeline doesn't actually have to be fair. So it might be a lot, lot more complex than just trying to make every single algorithm in the pipeline uh, fair. And so there have been some papers that have been like trying to look at those issues once again. Uh, and here I have like four of them that I know of. I don't know of any other paper in the computer science literature right now that's explicating this problem. And I think it's a very interesting and important decision, uh, like problem to look at. But also I might be wrong if I'm missing out on like any paper here, just let me know. But there is a fair pipeline paper by Bauer, Kitchen, Nistros, Vargas, and like Panketa Supermanian. There is a recent paper on individual fairness and pipelines by Dvorak, Ovento, and Jack Adisan. And then I have two papers with uh, Eshwar, Arunachal Eswaran, Sampas Kanan, uh, Aaron, right here, in which we also look at like those uh, composed effects of like having several decisions, like and having like decision pipelines. And finally, one direction I think is really important is like to try to look at feedback loops. Uh, because really the decisions we're going to make today are going to affect what populations and what data we're going to face in the future. And so we really have to take the long-term effect of our interventions into account. Um, an example of this is, you know, just like the rich are going to get richer. If you start with more wealth, you're going to get access to better loans, to better education, to better job, and you're just going to keep getting more wealth. Um, and so like, you know, how we make decisions today is going to affect like population wealth, possibly in the long term. An example, another example of this is predictive policing in which some of those predictive policing algorithms are going to try to make predictions about where crime is likely to occur. But if those predictive policing algorithms are going to start uh, with biased data, uh, what can happen is something like this. If you believe initially that like some, you know, so here is the true distribution of crime in red uh, in a population, like, like the population of like say drug users, uh, and in this, uh, in this graph here, this is like, well, uh, where drug arrests are going to be made. And this is like in the city of Auckland. And basically what happens on this picture, on this graph is the predictive policing algorithm usually believed that a lot of the crime was happening here. So they allocated a lot of police resources here. And because they allocated a lot of police resources here, they detected more crime in this area because they detected more crime in this area, they kept assigning more and more police resources to that area. And I created a negative feedback loop in which they just allocate resources in the same area over and over again, and just ignore it, can affect the rest of the city. And so that was something that was showed uh, in a really cool uh, work by uh, Loom and Isaac that's called to predict and serve. But it's just to show you, you know, really the importance of like feedback loops when you're trying to think about fairness, when you're trying to think about the decisions you're going to make. And here I just wanted to like cite a few other works and recent works that have been looking at those feedback loops. Um, there is the delayed impact of fair machine learning by Liu, Zin, Rolf, Asim, Jowitz, and Hart. Uh, there is a short-term intervention for long-term fairness in the labor market by Hu and Shen, uh, from fair decision making to social equality by Muzanar, Ohayan, Xian, and Srebro, and allocating opportunities in a dynamic model of inter intergenerational mobility by Haider and Kleinberg. And like once again, sorry, I'm like very short on time and I try to cover way too much. I don't really have to time to get into the details of those papers, but I really encourage you to check them out because they're really nice and they're really cool. Uh, and I believe it's exactly noon and I'm exactly done. <laughs>